I can interject with a very small data point that I think explains how I think about this after some time and reflection, which is I have something now that I didn't have in 2017, which is a relationship with my stepson. And he is 16. And when I think, let's not, lead, let's, not, let's not finish that thought, but when I consider how old he is and put myself at that age, suddenly the horror that I see in everybody else's faces that I have never felt myself about what happened to me and therefore has never been, has never been communicated from me, a sort of acknowledgement and awareness that this is not normal and that, the, that this is a horrifying and terrible thing to happen to, to a, a small person. I never apprehended it like that because I just thought of that 14 year old as me today. Right, right. Still, okay, and that's exactly what I picked. Look, that's exactly still, what I picked up from your from your interview. Until the last two years. Okay, and now so. I'm and now I'm I'm experiencing getting to know a child yeah. as a co parent. Yeah. As a stepmom. And now I get it. Now I, I, I look at somebody I care about who is two years older even. Um, and the thought of me at that age and someone taking advantage, suddenly I get it. I get it. I'm like, I would kill the guy. I would walk over there. I would shoot him in the head. Like, I get it now. I'm speaking today with Milo Yiannopoulos. Milo is a hard man to categorize. Part journalist, part performance artist, part agent provocateur, part comedian at wit and wit. Yiannopoulos is a man of immense and complex self-contradiction. He's half Greek and half Irish, but is known as an Englishman to the Americans with whom he has communicated extensively. He's gay and Jewish by descent. He married his long-term boyfriend, an African-American man in Hawaii in 2017, but faces frequent accusations of racism. He is or was strangely attractive to young American Republicans. In my view, for what it's worth, Milo was such a figure of inner contradiction and outer controversy that I believed from the beginning that his time was numbered. Nonetheless, the circumstances of his demise were unpredictable, I would say, and that's in keeping with his apparent destiny. After revealing details of his early sexual experiences at the hands of a 29-year-old priest whom he refused to name, he stated that he was an active participant in the events and that such occurrences were far more common and far more consensual than people were willing to admit. I don't think he ever recovered from the controversy that those comments generated. I should finish by saying that Milo is definitely now on the list of those who no one acceptably socially should ever speak to, which I suppose is one of the reasons why I'm talking to him. I wanna know what happened to him in his own words and I don't really give a damn if that's politically incorrect. Thanks, Milo, for agreeing to be on my channel and podcast. Thank you very much for having me. Um, I'm happy to share my thoughts about it with you. Yeah, well, let's, let's start. When that conversation about your early childhood sexual experiences first came out, I listened to it and I thought that there was tremendous trouble brewing there, you know, mm -hmm. uh, for a variety of reasons. And, if you remember, I phoned you at that point and suggested that we had a conversation and we made some efforts to manage that that never came to fruition. Mm -hmm. And I always felt that that was unfortunate. And so I'd like to, if you don't mind, I'd like to ask you about that situation. Because, you know, I, I had a lot of mixed feelings about what you said, like many people. And they weren't particularly judgmental, by the way. I mean. So you, and you correct me if I'm wrong here, because I want to get this story straight. Mm -hmm. You related some experiences you had with a priest mm -hmm. who was twice your age, right? Something and, like that. Yeah, approximating, approximately that. You were about 14. I think he was a little older than that, actually. Okay, okay, he was a little older than it's that. It's difficult to judge ages when you are 14. I, okay. think I, thought, I think I thought that he was younger than he was at the time, and subsequently found out he was perhaps 10 years older than I thought he was. It's okay, difficult okay. To so, age age. But there was a, but, but there there was a significant age gap. age gap. Yeah, yeah. And, yes. and so arguably, 
he was someone who was in a position of authority and mm -hmm. that what he did with you was something that he shouldn't have done. And also, it's highly probable, given the nature of such things, that you were by no means his only, let's say, target. Mm -hmm. Now, when I heard you talk about that, the first thing that struck me about the way that you formulated it was your refusal to play victim. And I actually well, found I didn't that, see myself as one. I know, I know, I know that, I know that. And, and that actually struck me as rather admirable because you came forward and said, um, this is an uncomfortable truth, but you know, I was of sufficient age to have a mind of my own. And this was something I was pursuing of my own volition. And then but it's how I felt at the time. And right. you know, when you talk about the, the abuse of authority or whatever, I've never met an authority I recognize or respect. You know, people have to earn my respect. I have never encountered a person in a position of responsibility or authority who I have respected and, um, uh, and deferred to merely by virtue of their office or their position. Right. Um, so I it's just, also the a, fact I sort of constitutionally don't recognize authority. So it, that element of it did not strike me until someone told me. You know? Okay. Okay. Well, that's the thing. Okay. So, well, I can imagine that because I don't imagine that you were much different in some sense when you were 14 than you are now, you know, apart from obvious Not maturation. <laughs> you know, that seems like a perfectly appropriate statement. Now, despite the fact that when I heard you speak about what happened to you and my admiration for your refusal to play innocent victim, I also had contradictory ideas that I think were more a function of my clinical training. and. There were two of them that I'd like to discuss with you. I mean, the first is, you know, when you think about yourself as a 14 year old, you think about that 14 year old as, a, as yourself. You don't necessarily think about that 14 year old as a 14 year old. And mm -hmm. you know, when you remember your 14 year old self, and then you go out and you see some 14 year olds, it's actually quite a shock or it can be quite a shock because 14 year olds are often a lot younger and a lot more clueless than, than you remember I, you. Yeah, than you remember so, yourself being, you know. Yeah, and, I think I know where you're going with this and I, and I, and I Well, and so, so. Go ahead, go cause, ahead. Well, because the second part of what I thought was that like it, and, and this is this, the incredibly tricky part of this conversation, as far as I'm concerned. I mean, one of the other things that got you in real trouble apart from the fact that you wouldn't name your, the person that you interacted with, your abuser, so to speak, mm -hmm. was that you made the unforgivable case, I think, publicly, that this sort of thing happened far more commonly than people were willing to admit. And I just, as soon as you said that, I thought, man, you're, you're dead in the water. Because it was interesting that watching, may be, yeah, good. well, true that may be, it's not something that can be publicly discussed. It's not, you know, and, 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 uh, I want I you to again to, tell- I, I went a bit further though j than just okay. that. I, I, took it, I took it a step further even and said that not only is this something that happens far more often than people are willing to admit, it is a function of gay life and gay right, right. Uh, uh, adolescence, blossoming, whatever. And um, it is a proper subject for humor. And I insist on it being a proper subject. Yeah, well, I wasn't even going to bring those two things up because I thought that just, you know, that, that merely bringing up the first part of that would cause enough trouble. But I'm glad that you did bring <laughs> the second part of that up. Well, because there's a serious conversation that has to be had about this and the damn conversation hasn't happened. And I don't mean specifically about, even specifically about your particular experience, although I think it's a way into the conversation. It's like, the first question is, well, It'd be, it'd be interesting to take apart some of your claims, and I'd like to do that with your permission. And I don't expect this to be an easy conversation. No, that's, I so, wasn't expecting to be, so go ahead. Okay, okay. So the first thing I would say is that it isn't obvious to me that even if you were a willing participant in what happened to you when you were 14, that that justifies what happened to you on the part of the person with whom you were participating. Well, no, of course it doesn't. But the okay. way I apprehended it was that it was me. 
Right. And I rem- but, but, and, and, and when I said a moment ago, I think I know where you're going with this. I can interject with a very small data point that I think explains how I think about this after some time and reflection, which is I have something now that I didn't have in 2017, which is a relationship with my stepson. And he is 16. And when I think, let's not, lead, let's, not, let's not finish that thought, but when I consider how old he is and put myself at that age, suddenly the horror that I see in everybody else's faces that I have never felt myself about what happened to me and therefore has never been, has never been communicated from me, a sort of acknowledgement and awareness that this is not normal and that, the, that this is a horrifying and terrible thing to happen to, to a, a small person. I never apprehended it like that because I just thought of that 14 year old as me today. Right, right. Still, okay, and that's exactly what I picked, look, that's exactly still, what I picked up from your, from your interview. Until the last two years. Okay, and now, so. I'm, and now I'm, I'm experiencing getting to know a child yeah. as a co-parent, yeah. as a stepmom, and now I get it. Okay, so, <laughs> now, okay, now okay. Get it. all right. So, you know, I've seen this, with my clinical clients, you know, who, who fail to notice in some important way that the person they were sometimes decades ago is not the person they are now. And the memories they have from those times, which are appropriate to those times, are not the same memories that are appropriate to those times now, given their relative maturation. I so think that's I fair. Thinking, and I think it took that that change in my life circumstances for me to, to jolt me into realizing uh, exactly what you're saying. Um, okay. So let, so let me ask you some questions about that. So what, what's, what's changed in the way that you view what happened to you? And if you were interviewed, well, and I guess you are being interviewed about this right now, if you were being interviewed about what happened to you, at age 14, I have two questions or three questions about that. Mm-hmm. What do you think of the propriety of that? How do you now view your role? Mm-hmm. What do you think about the culpability of the person that, that I would say in common parlance preyed upon you? How has that shifted? In the same way that there is, um, although it has been ruined by the progressives we both hate so much, um, a proper place for outrage. It is a necessary and right human instinct and emotion that has a place. There is also perhaps, much as it has been ruined by the progressives, a proper place for victimhood, when you are in Mm. fact actually a victim. Right. And I think that now I perhaps realize that I was one when I didn't know that I was one in 2017. Yeah, well, that's a hell of a thing for someone in your position to admit. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, no, it's, it's rough, man. And I, and I think that that's as concise and as true an answer as I can give you. Um, and I okay, think okay, so the, let's, let's go I into that a little bit. The answer because now I, I, I look at somebody I care about who is two years older even, um, and the thought of me at that age and someone taking advantage, suddenly I get it. I get it. I'm like, I would kill the guy. I would walk over there. I would shoot him in the head. Like, I get it now. You know? Okay, okay um, so that's, so that's a lot I different. That's a lot different. I didn't get it when I was... I didn't get it when all I had to go on was my memories of being me at the time. Yep. Yeah. Well, one of the things that struck me as so absolutely absurd about what happened to you in the aftermath of that interview was that I thought, okay, this is really, and it's exactly what I would have expected to happen to someone like you, because you're so contradictory, is that, is that you actually had a claim to victim status, which you then refused to capitalize on, <laughs> and then which people refused to bloody well recognize in the midst of the interview. Like, the proper response to that interview should have been something like, well, here's someone who's talking about uh, a case of child sexual abuse, but hasn't realized or recognized that they were, in fact, 
victimized in that situation and hasn't come to terms with whatever that might mean. And this so then- This is not go, uncommon among people who have been through these experiences because I have since writing about this, I wrote a little bit about this in, the, uh, in, in, a, in a short book I wrote about the Pope recently. Um, and, and in the other things I've, I've, I've the, the brief mentions I, I've made of it since 2017, a lot of people have written to me with their own accounts. Mm -hmm. And this is not uncommon. I have no, I'm, no, uh, I'm sure it's who not. Have, who have experienced this sort of thing. And I guess there's some point in middle age where the penny drops. <laughs> but yeah, um, I, I guess that, I guess, that, you know, there is, there is a right and proper place to acknowledge and understand that you were a victim of something. You see these, these, these posters on uh, New York uh, uh, trams on the subway, uh, whatever they're called. Um, and they, and they're saying, um, Oh, uh, there's, there's a guy there and he's called Hernandez uh, or Hernando or whatever. Uh, and his, um, and, and the poster is saying his uh, levels of HIV, thanks to his medication, aren't just undetectable. They're not transmittable either. It basically encouraging gay men to have sex with HIV positive other mm -hmm. men. Yeah. I mean, this kind of like sick, this is because conservatives have completely stepped out of that sphere entirely. Every time a conservative tries to say something um, in the gay world, even if it's with good intentions to help, they get, killed so so republicans and even just all sensible people have simply stepped out of lgbt stuff and they just don't get involved in it at all so you get this sick crazy like mental so with, with this you know the situation where they're encouraging these reckless unsafe horrendous behaviors and who suffers the most marginalized communities of all is, you know it's a, it's a it's a gay black americans have like a one in two chance of getting hiv you right. know Right. Like that's, that's crazy. And this is, you know, and this, this is, this is what gay charities are not talking about while they are insisting that, you know, on, on Ziza, Zem or whatever. But this is, this is the, the life cycle of rights movements when they run out of things to complain about, isn't it? Okay. So let me, let me ask you another personal question. Um, before I turn to something that will probably get me even more in trouble, in more trouble, we'll see. We'll see how that goes. Well, you've subjected me to a therapy session. I think you can, you can, uh, you can, you can get yourself into trouble as, uh, as compensation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, there, there, there should be plenty of trouble emerge from this. So, well, look now. One of the questions I had, again, as a consequence of watching that interview, was because, you know, you portrayed yourself as an equivalent partner in some sense, and I thought, look, that means that Milo hasn't updated his memories. Mm -hmm. There's still the memories of a 14 year old and that that's a problem. And, 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 and so, and you said that that's something that you've actually rectified over the last couple of years. And so that's, that's a very interesting thing to hear about. But then I was also convinced that because you were still viewing what had happened to you through the lens of your 14 year old, your iconoclastic and rebellious 14 year old self, mm -hmm. that, it was possible, likely even, although not necessarily the case, that you underestimated the consequence of this interaction on your subsequent life. And so now you just told me that, you know, yes. much worse things have happened to you. But yes, I, and in I, 20, yeah, yeah, you, you, you might be right about that because in 2017, that's what I thought. And then in the course of writing the, the short Pope book I just did, I asked the question, could this have affected the trajectory of my sexuality? Yeah, I mean, well, then I, I wonder. Of course that, well, it exactly, well, so, so, so what, what, in retrospect now, now, what do you think, what do you think it did to you? Like everybody, the mixture of nature and nurture in my case was probably swung over in that direction by a lack of good male, male role models in my relationship with my mother. Um, I distinctly remember picking um, ethnic minority male sexual partners and making sure that my mother saw me bring them home or saw me out with them to antagonize her. I distinctly remember picking sexual partners to annoy my mom. And that as demented as that sounds. And God, that's a, that's, that's a grist, I mean, like a three hour conversation. No, I mean, look, I take trolling very seriously. Uh, you know, <laughs> I, mean, um, I, I, I just, I'm not saying that I went to annoy my mom, although I have made that joke on stage before, but I remember an element of sort of mischief and defiance in there. 
which has always been at the core of my personality. Just this, this, this reflexive and unshakable refusal to bow to any kind of authority. Right. And so what were you more than that also, so... but, to not, but not just to thumb my nose at it, but to rub that authority's face in whatever it is that that authority finds so, the most repugnant. Okay. Well, so that's but, interesting. So first question there would be perhaps, what in the world were you so irritated or angry at your mother about that that might have been one of your potential reactions? I have said this in public before, so I don't mind sharing it with you again. Uh, my mother remarried and her new husband was um, uh, occasionally physically and constantly psychologically you know abusive i guess with the the word that we would use now um deep a deeply unpleasant home life in, in things like so i was a very pri private kid and i had all of these like um papers where i had written out poems and and constructed these like systems and i just i just had a very highly developed inner world you know and i've just lived in the realm of imagination and fantasy and private space and privacy was very important to me. And my mother's new husband, when I was at school, would go into my room and shuffle things around just so that I knew he'd been in there. So I knew that there was no space that was only mine. And I knew by extension that I wasn't welcome there and that I shouldn't be there. And that so long as I was under his roof, I would never be my own human being. And I would never have my own uh, privacy and therefore autonomy as a, as, a, as a human being. And I blamed my mother for this. I also blamed my mother for not leaving him when he hit me um, and I blamed my father for not taking me away, although I asked him to. And that mm -hmm. sort of began a chain reaction of resentment for both of them. Right. And so, okay. So most of the major authority figures in your life as parental figures had your experience at that point was of, of betrayal of various, mag of, mag of, of various magnitudes, right? Yeah, they, did, they didn't have my back. Right. It, it, from, from, from proper betrayal all the way down to just not having my best interests at heart, not having my back and, and, you know, all manner of experiences on that spectrum. But I don't think I ever felt like my mother would go to the wall for me, you know? Right. Right. That's, yeah, that's rough, man. Because one of the things you really want from at least one parent or at least one person in your life is the notion that fundamentally, Man, you got to have someone who's got your back. Got well, I did get it later. I did get it later in my mid to late teens with my grandmother. Um, as so many um, oddballs do, they end up skipping a generation uh, and, and form, forming a, a close bond with a grandparent. Um, I did get it from my grandmother and I got the sort of unconditional love and support that I recognized again in the man that I'm now with. Um, so I have had that since in my life. And I'm not wanting for it. I don't lack it. I'm very happy with the amount of it that I now have. But I so didn't that's have that's made it. up for it in some sense. Oh, for sure. Oh, for sure. Um, well, but, I didn't, but I didn't have it at the time. Mm -hmm. And I do remember really wanting them to hurt. I remember, right. and, and this is, I, I think one of my, in addition to my ability to sort of see round corners and cult culturally and sort of tell what's coming next, which I'm very good at, I'm also very good I'm very good at sort of intuitively figuring out what makes people tick and what drives them. Um, and I quickly identified that social justice warriors were sort of hurting and wanting everyone else to hurt like they were. Um, when I, when I very, very first started doing my speeches because it was something I had felt myself, but only as a child, I had grown out of it and clearly they had not grown out of it. Right. Right. Um, but I saw in them that same sort of petty, vengeful, vindictive desire to make the world burn. Uh, because they were hurting, that I had felt myself as a 13, 14, 15 year old. What I said was, and I wouldn't phrase, this way, phrase it this way again, because it was, it was not quite what I meant. And it was, let's say, incautiously phrased to put it mildly. What I said was that relationships between older men and young, I should have said younger men, are a common function of gay life. And I still have a question about the, the older man, younger man relationship issue. Oh, and, can't we talk about something else? Well, like, uh, humor, me for, humor me for two more minutes because there's actually somewhere right. I want to go with this. Okay. So 
the the first issue is where is the line property drawn in those relationships as as far as you're concerned with regards to age uh, and, and where and where is it usually drawn because those so are now you're trying to get me now you're trying to get me in trouble I, I'm not I'm really not I don't want to get you in trouble I and I don't think there is a line to properly be drawn because you're basically just talking about uh, talking degrees of degeneracy at that point, aren't you? Um, you know, the fact that you get saddled with this aberrant sexuality and you then have to go out and make the best of it. Um, the fact that you find this paternal or avuncular dimension in a, in a relationship with an older man that may also have a sexual component. I mean, this is layer upon layer upon layer of dysfunction. So you're not going to get me to say 10 years is the right gap because none of it's the right gap. It's all fucked up. <laughs> like, it's What's all... the alternative? <sighs> I don't know. I mean, I partly, I partly, conversion hypothetically, conversion the I wish conversion therapy would be marriage. Yes. I wish conversion therapy worked. Um, at least- yeah, You've said that before. You've said at that. least in the case of lesbians, we know that we can push women back, into, to back, back with men, and most of them will be happier as a result. With men, on the other hand, some of us are just gay. Uh, mm. And- I'm not going to be drawn on what the correct kind of fucked up dysfunction. Okay, well, okay, well experience first of all, is. I wasn't, I wasn't trying to corner you, you know. Um, <laughs> and, well, I don't want to corner you. This is something I'm really curious about because you, you made the case and you made a strong case that relationships between younger men and older men were very common in the gay community. And that seems well, it's not me making the case. That's an established fact. I mean, every gay person knows that. That's got nothing to do with me. That's just me pointing out something that every gay person knows. A father, a real father, doesn't sit idly by while children are being abused. He takes, you know, he takes steps to stop it, and he punishes the people who have done wrong. Okay, that's so, the, so that's, that's the righteous indignation and outrage of a true father. And yeah. those are... That, and and that, that appreciation of, you know, like it's, it's right and proper to hate the hateful and we should be outraged about right. it. Well, and you said that's part of what you've learned over the last couple of years. Right. And, but that, that heroic manly virtue is something that has been sort of systematically wiped out of the Catholic church, just like it's been wiped out of other uh, places in public life. Yeah. Like it's yeah. gone from journalism. Like it's yeah. gone from academy and it's yeah. had results that everybody knows about in all those different arenas. So it was interesting to me writing the book, finding that most of the problems most of the things that are happening in the Catholic church, most of the problems the church has got itself into basically boil down to there being no men. It's all women and gays. And the, the vast majority of the child abuse scandal and all of the other things that are wrong with the Catholic church are a product of the church losing its connection to masculinity and simply having no men left in it. Oh, good. Well, good. There's nothing controversial about any of that. So that's quite a relief. So, we, see, right. we, can, we, <laughs> we, we don't have to be in peril. See, that was a joke. Every, that was a joke. <laughs> Just so you know that I can actually pull one off. Okay, so I want to return to something, if you don't mind. Hmm. I want you to tell me what you think the consequences of what happened to you when you were 14 might have been. Okay. I don't know. Can I you don't guess? Think I mean, I, look, if you're not, like, if... if I'm, I'm, not, I'm not unwilling to discuss it with you. Yep. I'm not having a problem being forthcoming. Yeah. I just don't know. I, the only thing that I've really thought about is whether or not it might have affected the trajectory of my sexuality. And I think that it may well have done, but I don't think it on its own was enough to make a difference. And I think I'm probably you, right you about know, that. You've also talked about, just in this conversation, about the transgressive nature of that, that that sexuality and now you've participated in that even it's let's say as an active participant and mm -hmm. the question is what did that do to you what what did that what did the knowledge of that do to you because you had to live with it i don't know if it's a fair question i don't know if i'm phrasing it no no you're phrasing it fine i just don't know the answer to it um, in the same way that I don't think anybody can know what quote unquote made them gay, you know, it's like everybody has is born with, I, I think um, everybody is born with a more or less of a, of a predilection, whether or not you believe in epigenetics or whatever. Um, some people do, some people don't, but I think everybody probably has a, a sort of predisposition 
uh, and coupled with early experiences, you end up either mostly having sex with men or not, right? Um, I don't think that we're ever conscious of the processes acting on us at the time, and therefore it's very difficult. It's just pure speculation based on whatever we happen to remember, trying to work out what it was that made the difference. And I don't think it's, I don't think it's something that could ever satisfactorily be answered because simply because we're just not aware of the processes acting on us. I don't know if my dad not saving me from, you know, that household made me, you know, sort of made some kind of misfire rewire, like, you know, I I said said something haywire in my brain. I don't know whether I resented and just, you know, just like my mother so much that I went off all women. I don't know. And I don't think there's ever, ever any way to know. Okay. And for the same reason, I don't think there's any way that I could possibly answer. And I don't think there's, I don't think anybody could be on blind speculation. And I think that most people who are, most people who try to explain, I'm so sorry, somebody's mowing the lawn. Um, most people who try to explain what abuse might have done to somebody, in almost every case, I see their political prejudices and their biases at work, uh, you know, out there in search of justification. Right, because right. the truth is, I have no, I have no goddamn idea, and neither does anybody else. No one can possibly have a clue because these things are acting below the conscious level on us in a way that we cannot dissect and analyze. Okay, okay. I'm sure a lot of people will uh, watch this, so this is officially the last time I will ever speak about bloody February 2017. Um, so if anybody wants to know anything, you can watch this video, and that's it All right. for good. All right, good. Well, thanks a lot. Best of luck with your new endeavor. (laughs) Cheers. Best of luck to you. Take care. All right. Bye-bye. Bye.